I am super excited to introduce you to David Furman. Many of you know who he is, many of you know him personally, and many of you are probably meeting him for the first time today. Uh, he's a Charlotte native, an architect, a developer, specializing in creating the urban experience through unique residential and mixed-use developments. He also designed and developed over 40 projects in Uptown Charlotte and in South End, including the first high-rise condo in Uptown. Uh, he's received a ton of accolades, uh, both as an architect and as a, as a community activist, including the Vision Award from Charlotte Center City Partners, Charlatina of the Year from Charlotte Magazine, and a Pillar of the Industry Award from the Charlotte Business Journal. He's also an accomplished artist and, and uh, sculptor uh, in his own right, creating these amazing pieces from found wooden objects, uh, which you're going to see some examples of shortly here. Um, and here's the thing about David. You know, whether he's creating art or developing uh, architecture or participating in countless efforts to you know, advance um, Charlotte's urban presence, you're going to learn that sometimes David Furman uh, follows the rules, sometimes he makes the rules, and sometimes he breaks the rules. Um, and this is one of the things we love about him. In short, the work of this wild and unruly creative leader has allowed us all to wander, to commune with each other, to lose ourselves and to really find enchantment uh, in the city that we call home. So ladies and gentlemen, here to boldly lead us into his creative wilderness, please welcome the one and only David Furman, everybody. Come on up. Wow, 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 that's crazy. You got to, you, you let that introverts in the room here, man? This is, <laughs> this is a, a bit intimidating. Uh, I actually went and looked at, to see, I've never been to this event, so I went last night to see who comes to this event, and I'll have to say it's a, a bit intimidating, because I, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you're the future, and I'm the past, and, uh, well, I'm just, I'm still rocking, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm uh, certainly uh, in the, the more, more days behind me than ahead of me, but you guys get up every morning, you understand the concept of getting up every morning, and doing something you're passionate about, and most people don't. And you understand that you just gotta do that or you're just kinda wasting your time on the planet. I love your manifesto, it's awesome. I, and, I, and I was reading that thinking about how I tried to incorporate those ideas in, in my life. And uh, that uh, I gave this speech one time where I was talking about the, well actually I did a, a article on uh, architecture and I titled it, Just Try, <laughs> Just Try. <laughs> And if you, uh, if you care and you try, well, that's basically what your manifesto says. So that's very cool. So thanks. Um, I'm going to blow through a bunch of stuff. I've got a lot of stuff here, and I hope I can get through it. But uh, oh yeah, this is, a, this, is a, this is a drawing of me that my daughter did when she was three. <laughs> She's now 45. And when we launched our architectural firm, this was our logo. And so it was on our hats and our t-shirts and our koozies and our stationery. And I had a big fro at the time, so it was kind of appropriate. She got a little bit of the fro going on there. Uh, but we started the firm, and my idea was I'd worked for a conventional architect, and then I thought, I'm just, I want to start my own firm, and I want to do, I had three goals. First goal was to do great stuff. I just wanted to do work for people that cared, that wanted to push you and wanted to do great stuff. And the second goal is I wanted to have a good time doing it. I wanted to work hard and party hard. And we had a young firm, and we did exactly that. You know, I was, I was early 30s, and the crowd I was with was 20s. And we had, a, we had a great run doing cool stuff. And my third goal was to make some money. And I, and I realized quickly that if I really focused on one and two, that I wouldn't have to worry about three. And I, I re actually never really have. Uh, and I've never made decisions based on what sort of the... Uh, financial result was going to be, which is kind of amazing that I made a ton of money. <laughs> uh, that's just my accident, you know. I, I came home one time with my wife after taking all these chances, and, I, and uh, uh, I said to her, I said, you know, today I learned that we might just lose everything we have. And uh, she looked at me and went, so? Where do you want to go to dinner? And I was like, didn't care. So it was really cool. But anyway, we did a, we've done a bunch of housing. And we're housing guys. This is sort of the first uh, uh, sort of mainstream downtown condominium we did years ago. This is the first building where apartments wrapped around a garage in Charlotte. Uh, it was down on Graham Street. Uh, 
we've done a bunch of housing, got a, thousands and thousands of units that have built through several architectural firms. And we've done a bunch of projects that didn't get built. I love, I have a whole wall full of projects that didn't get built. I call my graveyard. But they're some of the coolest projects we've ever done. And I, just, I look at it for inspiration every day. Um, that firm sort of, there was a recession 30 years ago, and that firm just crashed against the wall. Uh, we went from full throttle, 25 people, drawing as fast as we could to uh, nothing, no work. So my wife and I uh, refinanced our house. Um, Went to Bermuda, <laughs> rented a house on top of a, a mountain with a swimming pool. We had no money. And I think I'm, I'm probably still paying for that. It stayed there for several months and then came back and, and decided, all right, I got to get on with this. We'd worked for developers all my life. Um, I thought we'd just have to make the phone ring. The phone wasn't ringing anymore, so we we're going to start building our own projects and developing our own projects. So we did several sort of mainstream developments. We focused on infill, for sale stuff. And then I decided that I really did not want to do mainstream stuff anymore. I thought that the condominium business, which we were working on, uh, was focused on very conventional thinking. If it didn't have two bedrooms and two baths and crown molding and a fireplace and those kinds of things, then you weren't going to be able to sell a condominium. And I thought there was a market of people out there that just wanted something different. And I thought if it was 1% of that market, that's cool. That's the 1% of guys I was going to go try to get. So we bought this piece of land. It was 30 feet wide by 300 feet long to veneer what was then the Charlotte's largest parking garage. And we built a, a loft building beside it. And these units were, we had retail on the ground floor. The units were very small. They had the steel stair that went up to a sleeping loft. Concrete floors, concrete walls, or brick walls, everything was exposed. Nobody would seen any, I mean, this was, this was, I don't know, 25 years ago, nobody would seen anything like this. And we set up a kiosk in Founders Hall, which was actually busy then. <laughs> it's kind of a tomb now, but. Uh, we set up a kiosk and we sold this whole project in 24 hours. It was, it was amazing. People were lining up, running to ATM machines, getting cash and throwing it at us. And I went home with this cash coming out of my pockets. It's like, I think we hit on something here. This is, I think this is going to work. So uh, from then, I thought, okay, creative work, creative uh, condos, creative housing for sale is a good avenue. This is First Ward, which uh, a long time ago was not a good place to be. It was a, it was a pocket of poverty and a pocket of hopelessness, which... Uh, builds a pocket of problems. And so Bank of America and the city decided to revitalize it. Uh, they assembled all the, develop all the local developers in a room and said, all right, we're going to rework this part of the city. Who's on board? And it was just crickets in the room. And I raised my hand and said, you know, this is five or six blocks from Tryon Street. You know, this is uh, urban, a chance to build a new urban neighborhood. And if there's a commitment to infrastructure, we'll do all the sites you give us. And so we put every site we could under contract. I, did, you know, I was putting, putting things under contracts easy. Actually, paying for them is different. But, but we built a ton of projects. We built, these were new ideas. With, this was a loft-style townhouse that had just open floors, and then it went up to a roof terrace. And we just did, I bet we did a dozen projects in First Ward, and we built a neighborhood, which I was I'm very proud of when I walk the streets down there today. It's just a tremendous neighborhood with some cool architecture. Uh, this is the first mixed-use project in South End. It's sort of hidden behind a bunch of stuff now, but it had retail on the ground floor. Uh, all those on the front are sort of loft-style offices, and then there's residential wrapping, and there's a little garage in the middle. And each side of this is really a different project that faces a different piece of the neighborhood in response to that. But they were very unique units. They're, you can see they're, they're tall, skinny. There's a townhouse and then there's an inverted townhouse on top of it. So you went in the top and you went down to your bedrooms. But they were very affordable. Our Centro company was, was founded on, on three principles. We wanted to do exclusively urban architecture because we thought there was a resurgence in the American cities. And we wanted, to, we wanted it to be exclusively sort of more adventuresome architecturally. And um, we wanted to be more affordable. Uh, so we drove that by just doing tiny stuff. <laughs> the units were small. These are like 500 square foot condos in downtown Charlotte, back behind a gas station over in Fourth Ward, a really terrible site. But again, it's five blocks from Trine Street, and we sold these units for $120,000 and 
uh, people could afford them, and uh, it was a great project for us. We built Charlotte's first downtown residential high-rise, and then we built Charlotte's second downtown residential high-rise. I, I love these. Uh, it, for a crowd, well, for me, I love a sketch like this. This is sort of the original concept sketch of the trademark building, where we were laying it out, figuring out how it was going to work, how the garage was going to work, how the building was going to mass, and that, that's what it ended up being. And we, we decided to put public art into the project, which we had never done before. So we actually had a line item in the budget for, we actually had a line item in the budget for a giant fountain <laughs> that came in over budget. So we said, we're gonna put a public art out here. We had, a, we had a big unveiling of this piece with a tarp over it up to the seventh story balcony, had a big vent out there and pulled the tarp up. It was awesome. And the guy who did that piece on the wall did a piece in our lobby of the trademark building that we also commissioned. Um, so we had another recession, you might remember, in 2008. We slammed against the wall again, and our Centro company dissolved. So basically, the condominium business was over. And uh, so coming back out of that, I was trying to see, how can we do, how can we bring the ideas we were bringing to the for sale business, to the for rent business? So the idea was to build a project. This is the corner of West Boulevard and Camden. Ground zero in South End, and we had it under contract. We designed a project for it, and I wanted to do something different. So these are all tiny little studio units. There was a bar on the corner where it was the lobby of the building. You walk through there to get to your, get to the elevator to go to your unit and retail all along the front. I took this to the banks to get it financed, and they just glazed over. They just. You know, I bet there's not a banker in this room. <laughs> it's the most uncreative crowd you will ever meet. Uh, and unfortunately, they're decision makers. You know, if you, you guys that have all tried to borrow money for your ideas know that how hard that is to do when you're, when you're off the menu. It's very difficult to do. So they, I said, what would you finance here? They said, we'll finance a mainstream apartment project. Well, by this time, we were pretty well committed to this project had a lot of money tied up, so we turned it into mainstream, called my friends at Camden who do mainstream apartments, and they were like, yes, we'll buy that. So we sold it to them. So if we had to do mainstream apartments, I didn't want to do that, so I thought, okay, I think there's a revolution happening in the workplace. This is, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. I thought people didn't want to work in conventional offices anymore. They wanted funkier space. They wanted it to be different. They wanted to be in a, they didn't want to be downtown. They wanted to be in a different sort of uh, a uh, flowing neighborhood like South End. So we teed up this office building. This is next to what was Price's Chicken Coop. My friend that did the rendering, Risden McElroy, my great friend that does all these drawings, um, created the uh, chicken wing sculpture down there, you might notice, <laughs> that we were going to put out in front as our homage to the coop. Uh, but this was well, had all retail on the ground floor. We had a shared conference room there where the 1616 is took this to the lenders and they just went, no, nobody wants to work in South End. There'll never be offices in South End. <laughs> Man, how many high rises are under construction now? So we could not get it financed because I didn't have the firepower to do that. So I took it to my friends at Beacon, who are, is a great company, does great work. They were, they were turning their company into something that was more funky and more different and wanted to be in South End big time. So. They took on the project 100% uh, um, speculatively. There was no tenants. And by the time it was finished, it was 100% leased. So all those lenders had passed on that. And then there was a, uh, this is where a 100-year-old machine shop used to be. So uh, as we were tearing down the machine shop, in the basement were all these crazy things. So we set a bunch of them aside and then came back and created this sculpture as sort of a homage to the, the Charlotte machine shop. Um, so, we couldn't do, you know, circling back to the lenders. <laughs> uh, there's so many mainstream apartments going on in the last few years that we, they were like, hey, maybe something different would be cool. <laughs> so, we brought back our concept from, you know, six or eight years ago and said, we want to build a building that's all studio units, all small. And they were like, great, let's do it. So, we got it done. This is behind the rail yard where we use, you know, Beacon builds these big office buildings. There's a big garage that comes with that. Nobody wants to see the garage, so we sort of buy the land around the garage and try to make the garage go away. And we try to use the parking that the, that the office buildings without building more parking. But what I'm most proud of on this project is we, we pioneered this concept of micro-retail. 
you know, it bothered me that all the small time retailers were getting pushed out of South End. So we built these tiny little retail spaces and lined the building with them on the street. They all have these glass garage doors that open up. You can spill your goods out onto the street. And they're all full of small time retailers. If you go by down there now, they're all women and minority owned, the majority of them. Uh, very diverse businesses. And I hope they're doing well because it's it's all filled up and it's really a really a cool little stroll back there behind the rail yard. Check it out. Uh, we kept doing that. We just finished this project uh, at the corner of uh, West and South Tryon, where we built a park for the city. With Beacon built the park uh, that was not in their budget. We managed to get it built and then you know sort of bring it back to them and they would pay for it. And then we veneered the garage with our uh, our micro units and our micro retail. And then we're starting to integrate public art into our projects. I want to blur the line between architecture and art. And there's a, there's a public artist in Charlotte, Ivan DePagna. I don't know if you guys know Ivan, or whether he's been at this podium before, but you ought to, you ought to get him here. He is, he's a brilliant public artist. And we're partnering with him on a bunch of things. So we got Ivan to sort of integrate this idea of putting these fins into the balconies and making the public art part of the architecture. So. It really looks cool. And it's sort of, if you look out there, it, what they're blocking the view of is the check cashing place and the, <laughs> some other stuff. So you still have a great view off to the side. So. And then there's these gates around a transformer. Why make those boring? Why not make them cool gates? So Ivan did those. And then we're building this shade structure in the middle of Wilmore Park that Beacon and, I, and our Centro company are funding this shade structure that Ivan has designed. And you'll, you'll see it going up this summer. It's going to be very, very cool. A rail yard. Uh, Ivan uh, curated this rail yard uh, piece on the side of the rail yard building. The Pepsi Cube, I don't know if you guys have seen that. It used to be a Pepsi, uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina's Pepsi plant was at the uh, Newburn Station, and Lennar built a big apartment project there. So we went to Lennar and said, Let's, we, we need to put an homage to Pepsi out here. We got Pepsi to donate thousands of cans. Uh, Ivan designed this, and my friend Glenn Nosick at 3C, uh, C3 Labs did the uh, construction and installation. It looks like the Pepsi Cube dropped to earth. I think it's very cool. Uh, the the uh, uh, color forest along the rail trail, just buffering you from the, from the uh, parking lot there as you go down the trail. This is another Ivan DePagna piece that we curated, and our friends at Center City Partners got funded for us. These are the doors outside of my uh, art studio downtown. This on prominent corner. It's just boring, and it's just, you know, it's right there on the street where something ought to be retail. So I just designed something cool and just put it up. Just put it up. Just do it. Don't, don't ask the people. Just do it. You know, what are they going to do? Oh, that looks terrible. Take that down. So, so we just did it. And then somebody called me the other day and said, I have this warehouse full of chairs. I got to get rid of them because I'm losing the warehouse. And somebody told me you were nutty enough to figure out what to do with these things. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, flip me the keys to your warehouse and I'll go over there and fool around. And so I said, well, maybe you can make them into these spines. And then, well, why don't we make a chair monster? So this is the sculpture we're calling the chair monster, which you can see is built. We just don't have a place to put it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so we found a place, we keep finding a place, and we lose it, and we find it and lose it. I think we've got a place that we're working on now, and uh, hopefully it will be appearing this summer. Obviously, it's built, um, and through Center City Partners, we've gotten some funding for it to make it happen. Uh, so I think the chair monster will be out there. Keep your eyes peeled for it. Uh, I love this little sketch. A, a buddy of mine bought a warehouse on uh, South Boulevard, very nondescript, wanted to figure out how to do something cool to the entrance of it to give it some life. And the, the address was 4111. I thought, well, that makes just a great structure. So we built it. And if you go out south and look on the left as you pass Scaly Bark Station, it's just a really, really cool building that Edifice, the construction company, is in. Um, I went to Center City Partners about 12 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, and said, I want to do a study to take this sidewalk that goes beside the light rail and turn it into a grand linear park, a promenade uh, that connects all the businesses and connects the people and make it happen. And so, along with my friends Terry Shook and Richard Petersheim, we created this document, which was a vision 
of how to make the rail trail into this wonderful park. Um, there was like 85 or 90 different interludes and episodes along the way. But like all vision plans, what a vision plan does is kind of an academic exercise. It ends up on the shelf, and there's never an implementation strategy to make these things work. So I wanted to start making things work. So there was all these leftover pieces of land, so I designed these chairs that are sort of a take on the Adirondack chair where you could put a lap type or a lunch on the, on the arm and sit there. And I had six of them made out of steel. They're really heavy, so they're hard to move. And I just took them out and dropped them on the trail. <laughs> and just dropped them. And all of a sudden, these leftover grass spaces became places where people then started gathering. And I thought, OK, I could, I'll just keep doing this. So, well, this is rail trail initiative number seven. So I, I, I don't know how many I actually did, but I just kept cranking them. So you, if you've been on the trail, you might have seen the big red exclamation point out there that I was literally, the people that made this were headed on a truck and said, where do you want it? And I went, well, I don't know. I was on my bike riding up down the trail. And I said, I got it. I've got a space. And so, so that little cut out there on the sidewalk is all right, that's where we're going to put it. So we dropped it there. This is the, my, my tall table. You climb up on the stool, you sit on the top, you have a checkerboard up on the top. So we just built these things and put them out there. This is my hex pong table where six people can play ping pong at the same time. <laughs> and my favorite is the, the before I die uh, chalkboard. Uh, I put an eight foot before I die chalkboard out there and within 24 hours it was totally covered up. It was amazing. And so we made it 16 feet. We initially doubled it and, and again you can see how it gets covered up. But it is the most interactive and coolest thing out there. And it's not my idea. I mean, we, you've seen those around the country but we just did it. We just built it and put it out there and now Center City Partners has taken it over and they've made it nicer and they've curated it. But I was out there one day, one night and this little sweetie was out there before I die, and I want to read this to you. Before I die, I want to make history for the future. I want to stop people from littering. <laughs> I want to tell on bullies and be brave. I want to give cheer to people. I want to make people love. Drop the mic, man. That was like, if I ever was questioning why I was doing this stuff, I had my answer that night. Uh, but the, the big deal is that uh, there's bigger places out there where I really can't do these gorilla things. I've got to permit them, get permission, and that sort of stuff. This was owned by cats, a great piece of land left over. So we designed and built this, what I call Edna's Porch. Edna was my grandma, and I used to sit in one of these swings on, over on Lamar Avenue and watch the cars go by. So we called it Edna's Porch that our Centro company just created and built and made happen. So with that in my pocket, I went to Beacon and said, Beacon had just bought this Fowler building. I said, you guys need to do something with this scrap piece of land back here. So we designed this connector so that it connected back to the street. We animated it. They paid for the, for the uh, deck, and we animated it with the um, seesaw. My friend Ben Parrish at Steel Design is just an awesome creative dude. Built a seesaw for me and then he built these hedges. I gave him a sketch and just said this is what I want. I want, you, I want to do a Corten steel hedge. You have to be able to see through it for a beacon to see the trains go by. But then over on the other side there were dumpsters and I said just build the opposite of what you built. <laughs> Unbelievable. This guy is just such a talent. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the recession, I, uh, this, is the, this is the best gorilla story ever, uh, I, I uh, didn't have anything to do. I didn't have any projects under construction, I didn't have any on the drawing board, and I was sort of getting depressed. I needed to go design and build stuff. But I lived downtown in a condo, where am I going to do this? The, this was the Polk building that was on Graham Street in West Trade. It had been empty for 15 years, so I got a locksmith to meet me down there and uh, told him I owned the building, and <laughs> I wanted to change the locks. He changed the locks, he flipped me the keys. I'm like, all right. <laughs> I need some electricity, so I got a meter over on Fifth Street, and I, I bootlegged some electricity. There was this big cable of duct tape to flagpoles going through and into the building. So I set up a shop inside this building. <laughs> I went to Lowe's and bought a bunch of tools. 
And I worked in this building for three years. <laughs> I didn't have any plumbing. I didn't have any uh, uh, heating or air conditioning. So, it would, you know, I had heaters and fans and whatnot. But I worked in there for three years building sculpture out of junk. And uh, I had several shows. At, this is at the New Gallery of Modern Art downtown where these uh, pieces are just made out of scraps of wood, furniture that I would tear apart, et cetera. This is a crib that a friend of mine gave me that her kids had quit using. So I, I tore it apart, made it into a piece of art, and gave it back to her and, with just the pieces out of the crib. I now have a legit studio because there was a, there was a <laughs> There was a car chase downtown, and uh, the guy lost control and rammed into my studio, so I got busted. <laughs> I, I literally got called out. I went down there, and there was cops, fire department, building inspectors, Duke Power guys. They were all around me going like, what's going on in here? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> my, my wife says I reverted to being six years old. I went, I don't know. So I, got, I had to move all my, well, they cut off my power and I had to move, so I, so I went legit. This is my studio, it's at the corner of 6th Street and the tracks in a big garage building, so I can, I can make a lot of noise in there. So I started making, during the pandemic, I started making Corona fish. <laughs> Just out of junk. There's a totem, little spins, there's an unpainted piece. Some of them are painted. This is the goat playing a violin from a Chagall painting, you know, that I was inspired by. This is a donor wall that uh, the men's shelter was made out of headboards for shelter. And that's my, and then, wait a minute, to the last, uh, <laughs> wilderness. How am I gonna, how's the urbanite gonna tie wilderness into this speech, I'm not sure. But I thought about this, these, are, these giraffes are mine. And they belong in the wilderness. <laughs> Unfortunately, they are urban giraffes, as you can, as you can see with the one wearing earrings. It was, it was sort, of, sort of a giveaway. But I, my friend Ben Parrish built these things at Steel Design. Unbelievable guy. I commissioned him, and he built them. And he, what do you want to do with them? And I put them on, they were on East Boulevard. I had to move them. And so what am I going to do with them? I put them in Wilmore Park. And... Uh, if you lived in the wilderness, you don't have to deal with uh, permits and permission and protocol, but in the city you do. So uh, the county has uh, asked me to move these. <laughs> I thought if I just put them there that people would love them. The, the, the kids in Wilmore call it the giraffe park. You know, they love them over there, but the county doesn't like them because I didn't follow the rules, and, and that's... That's the downside when you don't follow the rules. Sometimes you get slapped, so that's where I am on that. You know, if the, the rules that I break, you talk to me about being a, a, a rule breaker, and I don't know how my time is, but uh, I, I've got, um, I follow a sort of an ethical and moral compass. You know, I feel like I, I do things that for people, I do them, uh, I, if, as long as I follow an ethical and moral compass, I'm on solid ground. And if the rules get in the way of that, I don't care. I'm gonna, I call it the red light in the middle of the night thing. You come to the red light, you stop because you live in a civil society and you've got to give way to anybody who's there and you yield. If there's nobody there, you keep going. <laughs> you don't sit there at two in the morning at a red light when there's nobody there. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the way I feel about it. And you know, I, and it, it, it bugs me that that kind of stuff gets in the way, but I don't live in the wilderness. I live in the city, and so I've got to find a place for my city giraffes to park. So if you have any ideas, let me know. I'm done. Thank you.